we invite you to a mysterious journey to a fairyland where the travellers have paced thousands of times and discovered new sensations in every step. Join us in our journey and let's discover the dreamland together. It is far beyond any traveller's imagination. In our journey, we will have a close-up look to the lands which were once the cradle of opulent civilizations. And we need to summarize this journey with one word that should be Cappadocia. Let's start our journey by answering one of the first questions that comes to mind about Cappadocia. The million dollar question is, how did these exquisite masses, these legendary monuments, which stand like handcrafted by an artist formed, given the name Fairy Chimney, they make Cappadocians beautiful and special and turn it into a dreamland. Books say Mount Erses, Hassandar and Gilidar were active volcanoes in the geological periods. Alongside with many other volcanoes, eruptions of these volcanoes started in the early Miocene 10 million years ago and have continued until the present day. The lava produced by these volcanoes under the Neogen lakes formed a layer of tufa on the Platius. Lakes and streams which varied in hardness and was between 100 to 150 meters thick. Within the structure of this layer there are also many different geological elements other than tuff. Platius, having been essentially shaped with the lava from the bigger volcanoes, were continuously altered with the eruptions of smaller volcanoes. Starting with the early Pliocene period, the rivers in the area, especially Kuzulumak, the Red River, and local lakes, contributed to the erosion. Of course, if this magic touch can be called an erosion of this layer to the stone, eventually giving the area its present day shape. The interesting rock formations known as fairy chimneys, having been formed as the result of the erosion of this tufa layer, sculpted by wind and flood water, Running down on the slopes of the valleys, water has found its way through the valleys creating cracks and ruptures in the hard rock. The softer, easily erodible material underneath has been gradually swept away residing the slopes and in this way. Conical formations protected with basalt cats have been created. The fairy chimneys with cats mainly found in the vicinity of Uruguay have a conical shaped body and a boulder on top of it. It took these natural work of arts hundreds of years to form, which we now explained at once. Each one is another body and soul. The fairy chimneys are more intense at the valleys in the triangle formed by the towns of Urugu, Uchisar, Avanos, and other parts of Cappadocia. Other than the fairy chimneys, another characteristic feature of the area which make it especially beautiful are the sweeping curves and patterns on the sides of the valleys, formed by rainwater. Cappadocia is in fact a large area which comprises many different provinces, but the Cappadocia region, full of rock masterpieces, which gave its name to our journey, is not that large. It consists of Uchisar, Göreme, Avanos, Ugu, Derinkuyu, Kaimakla, Ihlara, and its surroundings, and is in Nevshehe. After years of excavation, scientists have discovered that Nevshehir has a fascinating history dating back to 3000 BC. Cappadocia was inhabited since the prehistoric times, 
stated at the south of Kuzaluma, Nevshavir had been under the sovereignty of Hittites, Azrian, and finally Persians. At last, the emperor of Macedonia, Alexander the Great, added this land to his sovereignty. Tired by being under the control of different surveyors, Cappadocia later was taken under control of Seljuks when they defeated Byzantines at Manskirt and entered a long period of relaxation. When Anatolian Seljuks faded away from the history scene, Mongols invaded these lands. In 1515, Ottoman Padishah Yavuz Sultan Selim beat Dol Kadirul Lara, Principality, and definitely took Cappadocia under the control of the Ottoman Empire. The outstanding and idealistic Ottoman administration founded medrahes as schools of science and mosques, where people got rid of their sins in a complete set of daily prayers. Both in Selçuk and Ottoman Marines, lots of caravansaries, mosques and medrases were built in this region. Nevshahir's ancient name was Nisa, but in the Ottoman period it was renamed Mushkara. The son-in-law of Sultan Ahmed III, Ottoman Grand Vizier Ibrahim Pasha was born in Nevshahir and with his loyalty towards his village, he took a great interest in its construction. The village was transformed with the building of mosques, medrases, children's schools, soup kitchens, inns and a Turkish bath. Pasha doesn't content with this and provides the castle of the village to be repaired and places Salalar, Turkoman, nomadic tribe in here. When the village flourishes this much, it's now a new city and acquires the name Nevshahir, which means new city. The mosque complex, which was built by Dalmat Ibrahim Pasha in the 1720s, consists of a mosque, medrasa, children's school, library, an Ottoman his soup kitchen, and a Turkish bath. We start with Kurshunla Mosque, because in Islamic cities, the mosque is the center of the city. Its elegant buildings, the biggest work of art, which Ibrahim Pasha built in Nevshahir. It was built in the year 1726. It is situated in a graded courtyard with three doors. The porch is with five domes in front of it and the 44 meter long thin minaret on the right is extremely elegant. The dome covering the main place has a diameter of 16.5 meters. In Islamic civilization, medrasas are the most ideal places for education and Ibrahim Pasha hasn't neglected the medrasa. Medrasa was built at the same date with the mosque. The medrasa, which has a dome ceiling with a diameter of 7.60 meters today, serves as a library. One of the most important parts of this mosque complex is the library. The library, which increased the importance of the mosque complex, was built in 1727. The most important books of this library was donated by Ibrahim Pasha before the construction was fully completed. The Ottoman his soup kitchen was built in 1726 and after being used as a prison for a short period of time, it was transformed into a museum in 1949. Next to the soup kitchen showing off in the same courtyard, the children's school was built at the same year with a soup kitchen. The ground floor of the two-story building is carved into the rock. The Turkish bath is at the north side of the mosque complex. It was built with hewn stone, there is a fountain in the middle of it, and the part of it for undressing is covered with a dome. Ibrahim Pasha wants to turn Nevshahir into an active trade centre. Below the courtyard of the Kurshun Mosque, again a remembrance of the Pasha. A part of Nevshahir's re-owned Baylik Inn still stands with all its splendour. The castle of Nevshahir. It's a companion to every move of the haughty sun from the highest point of the old city at the southwest part of the city. It was built at the time of the Seljuks. Restored by the administration of antiquities and museums, the witness to these splendid days still stands upright in its place. Avalos is full of magic. Avalos is the most magical part of Cappadocia. Are you curious about where the magic comes from? It comes from the mud. Yes, it is the mud. We all know very well. Cousin Romak divides Avanos into two and a suspension bridge crosses over the river. Cappadocia is not a land which can be wondered and told at once and certainly so is Avanos.
Throughout the history, people made Avanos their homes, and the civilization settled in Anatolia had left their marks in here. Even today, there are skilled workmen who knows the underground map of Avanos by heart. Today's homes were built over the houses and caves of the ancient civilizations which once settled in here. They say the streets of Istanbul are paved with gold. In fact, this idiom suits Avanos the better. Rich on mines around Avanos make this region two times valuable. The region is such fertile that craftsmen in here earn their living by pottery for centuries. Now on the land still provides them with enough soil to continue to earn their livelihood. Avanos is famous with its pottery, as it is situated on a volcanic area with the high quality mud Kuzulumak brings along on one hand, and the available clay beds on the other Avanos is extremely convenient for ceramics production too. The people of Avanots are born into this mud and it's a child's play for them to transform this mud into pots on their wheels. Here is the story of these work of art. The oily red soil used in pottery is transformed into a high quality ceramic clay after a series of processes and is ready to take shape in simple workshops. These workshops called Ushluk or Chanakane by local people are vaults covered, unimposing places and don't get sunlight. The floor of these workshops is soil. And there are one to four workbenches in them. One of the workbenches is placed close to the door, next to a wall, that takes light and is called Chukruk in the region. Formerly rotated with foot, Chukruk is now rotated with the help of an electronic motor. When the wheel starts to rotate, the clay mass starts to rise in a few minutes and takes shape in the skillful hands of the potter. The mud mixed with water in mud basins is rested until it reaches the right consistency. This mud shows special features according to the basin it's produced. It can be silica, loose, soft, hard or oily, and the type of the pot to be produced is determined according to these features. The fertility of the material gives the opportunity to the potter to create ceramic pots with different sizes. After the mud takes its form on a wheel, it's skillfully removed from the wheel and left to dry on an airy bench named Yenala. In the meantime, dyed, decorated and polished pots are stacked neatly in the furnaces after drying sufficiently. After being baked under a heat of 700 to 900 centigrade degrees, these pots reach the desired hardness and form. Traditional production consists of earthenware, water, jugs, jars, pots and cooking pots with lengths ranging from 20 centimeters to 1.5 meters. According to their forms and handle conception, pots named Ozuluk, Handy Water, Jug, Water Pot, Gebeje and Yardan are completely functional. Recently, there is a tendency to repeat the old forms on Anatolia, mostly Hittiti and Pyrgian ceramics for souvenir production.
Pottery is nothing new in the region. It dates back to the time of Hittites. The secret lies in the lead soil carried by Kazilola. The secret is in the red soil which transforms into water jugs, sculptures and amphoras in the gifted hands of the local people. If you enter the narrow streets of Avanos, you see lots of workshops. If you wish, you can attend a series of lessons in these workshops. The workshop of Avanos are open to anyone willing to learn about the pottery. Today, there are approximately 300 pottery workshops in Avanos. The very first settlement of Avanos dates back to the Bronze and Iron Ages, and there is the Splendor Ottoman Empire period. Avanos reached to its peak in this period of time because the Ottoman administration spared no sacrifices in order to develop this town. Houses with reveals on outer surfaces and decorated uniquely in the inside were built. In Avanos town centre, stated on the north bank of the stream, Yeni Mahale is abundant with the most outstanding examples of civil architecture. These are the most outstanding examples of traditional Ottoman civil architecture. In Cappadocia, houses are generally built in the slopes with hewn stone or by carving the rocks. The one and only architectural material is the stone. This stone is special because it is a volcanic stone that's soft when it's first carved out. Gifted hands process these stones and in interacting with air, these stones harden in time and take the form of a rock. In Anatolia, every region has its own culture and every culture has different tastes. So Avanos houses are unique to Avanos. Timber buildings are not that complex and detailed. They are simple but built with great artistry. The most important characteristic of timber houses is that they provide a climate control. In damp atmosphere, it inhales the humid and doesn't allow it to dense. The houses carved in the rocks are used for touristic purposes or as citrus fruit depots, as these houses are cold in the summer and hot in the winter. Avanos have some celebrated architectural masterpieces too. Here are some of them. Aladdin Mosque. It is a 13th century Seljuk masterpiece. It was enlarged by the additions built in 1964. Five kilometers away from Avanos. Sarahun Caravansary is another Seljuk masterpiece and like in most of the Seljuk work of art, it attracts attention with ornaments on its door. Zelve. Having a historical and touristic importance, Zelve is within the borders of Avanos district. Two kilometres away, turn off from the Gorome Avanos Road, lies Zelve where Christian and Muslim populations lived together until recent years. Zelve is an open air museum where you can see incredibly interesting natural formations. Here, three valleys connected with a tunnel is home to lots of rock hewn churches and monasteries along with mosques. The old settlement consists of rock houses carved in the walls of the valley. In 1952, the village was completely vacated. 
The two biggest churches of the 15 churches in the region are Uzumla and Geikli churches. Uzumla church has two sections. It is adorned with motifs of locket side crosses, vine branches, palm leaves and fish, but it unfortunately is in ruined condition. Geikli church, depicting the sacred roads, again another significant building of the region. Nowadays, the owners of the empty houses are the pigeons in the sparrows. They are the happiest. Rock houses, sharp pointed furry chimneys with huge bodies of present in the Gurume is a town between the fairy chimneys with a population of 2,000. Of course, this is the settled population. Before you enter the Gurume Open Air Museum, there are places you have to see in the town. Yusuf Koch Church is at 200 metres north of relaxation facilities near the Uchtpisar exit of Abjulai village. It is in a private real estate and stayed closed as a dove coat to the frescoes of it are protected but the columns have collapsed. You can see Durmish Kadir Church near the main road and its columns and arches are in good condition. We happen to see El Nazar Church. In El Nazar Valley, this church was carved from one piece of rock in a T-shape like a tent. El Nazar Church is partly destroyed, but we can still see the frescoes at the ceiling. In the valley between El Nazar and Gurame, there is the Sakla Hidden Church. After climbing to the plateau from the path, you can see the entrance of this church by descending from the plateau to the valley. The entrance is closed due to a landslide dating back to 500 years ago. The frescoes of this church are original. We are not mistaken if say they are numberless monasteries in the region. Most of them are destroyed and reached to date with their frescoes demolished. Besides the rock carved churches, Gurume Valley displays an impressive scenery with its natural appearance too. Now let's see the important churches and buildings of Gurunga Open Air Museum. The six to seven storey rock mass to the left of the museum entrance is known as the nunnery. Elimila Church is a rock housing church carved on the edge of the abyss at the south of the museum. Because the main entrance has clapped, we enter the church from a tunnel carved into a church wall. Here the wall and ceiling paintings have spilled down, the church is well protected as it was used as a dove coat. It fits the main plan of the Hagia Sophia. The church dates back to the mid 11th century and to the beginning of the 12th century. 15 scenes from the life of Jesus Christ has been portrayed. A portrait of Jesus Christ is in the main dome and some angel portraits on the others can be seen. Chapel of St. Barbara. This church is situated behind the rock housing Elmer Church. It has a cruciform plan with two columns. This church dates back to the second half of the 11th century. The walls and the dome are decorated in a variety of different folk motifs. Yulanda Church. The main section is transversely rectangular and barrel vaulted. The church takes its name from the painting of the dragon, which the saints have fought and killed. Karanga Church is fully decorated with paintings and this church has the most clear paintings with the colours of the frescoes are still vivid due to the absence of light. The paintings which portray the life of Jesus Christ are in good condition. Chorukla Church resembles the chapel of St Barbara with its four domed structure and Karanga Church with its paintings. In spite of the destruction, paintings still maintain their wholeness.
Near the lower part of the parking lot lies the biggest church of the region, Toko the Church. It is the one and the only church with its restoration has been fully completed. The Church of Mother Mary is one of the most beautiful churches of Gurume. The frescoes on the walls are as vivid as the first day they were painted and this makes your admiration for this place even bigger. Before leaving Gurume we can also see Kulichlar Valley. These two valleys between Gurume Valley and Aksipa consist of white tough rocks and are called small and big Kulichlar. The valley has an impressive scenery with waterways passing through fairy chimneys with its tunnels and strangely shaped rocks. built in four columns and with a big dome. Kulichlar Church is in this valley too. Chongshin is situated two kilometers from Gurume on the Gurume Avanos Road. There are two important Byzantine churches in this region. One of them is the Church of St. John the Baptist, and the other one is the church called the Big Dove Coat. The Church of St. John the Baptist is one of the oldest churches in the region. The church uses the Big Dove Coat that's built in the name of the Emperor, Nisiphorus. This church is 200 metres away from the Chavishin village towards Avanos, because its own stair has collapsed. An iron stair has been built to enter this church. This is a barrel vaulted church with one nave. It is quite big and in the frescoes on its walls, Ascension of Jesus Christ in some places of this life has been portrayed. One of the most important centres in Cappadocia is Urbuk, 20 kilometres to the east of Nevshihir. Like Gurume, Urbuk also had lived Byzantine, Selchuk and the Ottoman periods. Urbuk has the typical steppe climate as its summers are hot and dry. Winters are cold and snowy, springs and autumns are rainy. Within the district and its vicinity, great, growing its prevalence. Urugup is the most developed tourism centre of Cappadocia region. The tomb of Selchuk Sultan Ruknitin, Kulichlar Sam, was built in the highest hill of Urugup. Urugup too is established in a volcanic originated region where fairy chimneys are quite intense. It is these fairy chimneys that make the landscape picture of the region unique. So we can say, this region is a poem which the rain and wind, the history and geography wrote hand in hand. You can see scenery is unique to underground cities in Urubuk. Also part of it was built by carving the rocks to build rock houses or some of the houses with hewn stones carved out of rocks. These stones are soft when first carved out. As time passes they harden and this enduring houses constitutes an interesting architectural structure unique to this region. Urubuk was an administrative district connected to Kaitaru province and then became a district of Nevshahir. Cappadocia has witnessed sad stories and today so many young men rest peacefully in here. 
It has replaced its sorrows with sorrows, strengthens its joy with joy. Who knows maybe the fairies have deserted their chimneys years before. Uchisar. On the Nevshihir Dorema road, just 7 km from Nevshihir, Uchisar is the first stop to breathe. Uchisar is situated at the highest point in the region. The top of the citadel provides a magnificent panorama of the surrounding area. Shahir is an old settlement, the Ottoman Grand Vizier Karavizir Mehmet Said Pasha did the same thing in Gumshahir as Damat Ibrahim Pasha did in Nevshahir and a kulia was built in the town. The mosque complex consisted of mosque, a medrass and a fountain. Built with two coloured hewn stone with its lead covered dome placed on four arches and with slender minarets. Karavizir Mosque has an otherworldly atmosphere like in most of other historical mosques. This important area of ruins is situated on Gulshahir, Nevshahir Road at the right hand side but no one can make you believe in fact these are ruins. The place we mention as ruins is in fact a monastery and which once a rocky place, only this place was transformed into an arts museum by the magic touch of human. The monastery consists of chapels, dining rooms and monk cells but the ceilings separating the lower floors of the monastery are extremely thin. The people of that period of time, instead of just cutting it in order to make use of it, thought it both useful and to make it look like a building, they decorate the surface of it with artificial arches and arcades, so they could be able to address the eyes of people. One of the most important features of Achuk Sarai is the fairy chimney in here, are in the shape of mushrooms. Yes, fairy chimneys in the shape of mushrooms are unique to this area. Cappadocia has an invisible side to it, and this characteristic of Cappadocia makes you admire it two times more. Cappadocia people who use the natural materials skillfully on the surface of the earth has managed to create architectural masterpieces underground too. Now we continue our journey underground. Join us and decide whether the surface of underground is richer in Cappadocia. The first ring of this magnificent chain of underground cities is Derinkuya and it is situated 29 km from Nevshahir on the road to Nida. The city is approximately 85 meters deep. It contains all the usual rooms around in the underground city. Stables, cellars, storage rooms, refectories, churches, wine rooms, etc. Apart from these, a large room with a barrel vaulted ceiling, which is rarely seen in underground cities, and the second floor was a missionary school. 
the rooms to the left being study rooms. From the third and fourth floors onwards, the descent is by the way of vertical staircases, which lead to a cruciform plan church on the lowest floor. The 55 metres deep ventilation shaft was also used as a well. Not every floor was provided with a well, however, and some wells were not connected with the surface in order to protect the dwellers from poisoning during rain. Genically, an underground city was open to visitors in 1965, but so far only 10% can be visited. Kaimakla Underground City Kaimakla Underground City is built under the hill known as Citadel of Kaimakla in the centre of the town, 19 kilometres from Nevshahir, on the Nevshahir Nida Road. It was open to visitors in 1964. In the village of Kaimakla, the people constructed their houses around nearly 100 tunnels of the underground city. The inhabitants of the region still use the most convenient places in the tunnels and cellars, storage areas and stables, which they access through their courtyards. Kaimakla Underground City is different from Derinkuri Underground City, in terms of both form and organisation. The passages are low, narrow and sloping. Only four floors are open to the public, in which the spaces are organised around the ventilation shafts. There is a church in here too, the most important areas of the underground city are on the third floor. Besides numerous storage places, the block of anthracite on this floor is very interesting. Recent research has proved that this stone was used as a melting pot for copper. To be able to use it as a melting pot, many holes were carved on the surface of the stone before it was believed to be used for a grinding spike. This underground city is in the centre of Osilija village, formerly known as Zile, and is at 6 km west of Kaimak town Nevshahir, Derinkuyu Road. Osilija underground city is different from other underground cities, both in terms of its architectural and geological formation. In the structure of the underground city, there are tough layers with different colours. There is no floor system in the underground settlement, which is not completely clean but it is built with great living spaces. In the entrance there is a double arch place built with basalt. Then you reach the main tough rock via a 15 metre passageway covered with unhewn stone. The place is built with stone providing the entrance to the underground city is relatively new compared to the main carved rock places constituting the underground city. At the end of this corridor there is a milestone door which was built of granite. The main space at the entrance in the wider space of the underground city and consists of two compartments on the right hand side of the main space there are the cellars and on the left are the living rooms. On the sides of the fairly long galleries there are the cell type rooms and at the base there are traps. The town of Tuthlaren, located at 10 km north of the district of Ajagel, is one of the most interesting places of Cappadocia region with its underground city, churches and architecture. 
This underground settlement is located on a hill named Citadel, in the village of Tatarin. The underground settlement was first discovered in 1975, and in 1991 it was opened up for visitors. Still with its two floors open to visitors, with its toilets found in no other underground settlements except for Buzayurt underground settlement, but the size of the spaces, the number of the storage rooms and the great number of churches indicate that this place was either a garrison or a monastery complex rather than an underground settlement. Tantler and Church The narthex of the church, which has two naves and two apses, is collapsed. The well-preserved scenes in the frescoes are separated from each other with dividers. The background is dark grey, whereas with figures colours like purple, mustard colour and red are used. On the apse Mother Mary and Baby Jesus, Archangels Michael and Gabriel, Constantine the Great and Helena, Transfiguration, Anastatis entry to Jerusalem, Crucifixion and Portrait, Nine Saints as well for donors. Cappadocia is a poem telling one story, but everyone listening to it gets a different pleasure. 